In the last stream, we were working on setting up the builder from RF Tools here with the shape quarry card to automatically start mining all of the ores and other resources out of a 15 by 15 area of the mining dimension using the power of our Invar generator here. And as you can see between streams, it has managed to burn through all of the wood that we gave it to generate a fair amount of resources. Now you'll see here, it's only made it to Y level 29 and it's still on chunk zero of four. So it's not even made it to the bottom of the world yet. Hence why we don't have any redstone, diamonds, lapis, emeralds, anything like that. And it does still have three more chunks to go, but we do now have resources coming in. And between streams, I have done a little bit more manual mining using our new pocket storage unit to collect all of the excess garbage that we don't want to be carrying around and clogging up our inventory. You can see specifically that I've done a fair bit of mining down underneath a Y level zero, which is why we now have 1,590 deep slate cobblestone in our pocket storage device. And I've also gone ahead and run most of the ores that I mined manually through our dissolver, through our compactor, and through our furnaces here to get us a fairly decent amount of resources that are hopefully going to allow us to progress forward in today's stream. And as you can see here, I've also set up a couple new storage drawers for all of the resources that we're going to get from our mining. Now, I have moved the storage drawers and the draw controller away from where they were previously. I haven't moved the elemental storage drawers or the storage drawers holding the elements here from Alchemistry. The reason for that is that a lot of people, both in the YouTube comments and in the Twitch chat, have requested that I set up a periodic table of storage drawers to house all of the elements from Alchemistry. Basically, to recreate this right here, but with storage drawers. And I do think that's going to be a cool idea. I think it's going to look cool, but we currently don't have anywhere near all of the elements and it's also going to take up quite a bit of space. And so what I think I'm probably going to do at some point in the future is set up a secondary storage controller elsewhere and have a different wall of storage drawers specifically for all of our elements. And I think for the time being, we can use this like system here and we can expand out and add more drawers to this draw controller for all of our basic resources as we get more gems and more ingots from our mining system. And that leads me nicely onto what I want to work on in today's stream, because the first thing that I'd like to work on is automating the process of taking the raw metals that we have, the raw iron, raw copper, raw gold, and processing that into usable ingots. Now, initially, I was hoping we could do this with Alchemistry, hoping we could potentially automate the use of the dissolver and the compactor, because these guys are incredibly fast. If we uh, quickly grab some raw metal out of our system here, for example, let's grab a piece of raw zinc, we can run that through the dissolver, it's instant, and then we can run that through the compactor, and it's also basically instant. Now, the trouble here, though, is that I don't believe we can automate the compactor because the compactor in this version of Alchemistry automatically locks itself to whichever material you just tried to process. And so, for example, if we were to now grab some raw tin, we can run that through our dissolver just fine and get the tin elements. But if we put that in the compactor, nothing is going to happen. We have to specifically press the reset target button manually to allow it to accept the tin and make tin dust. And now you can see again, we can't put anything else in that's not tin without pressing the reset target button again. Of course, you could get around this by having a ton of compactors. If we had one compactor for every single metal, then we could make this work. But that seems incredibly tedious. And I do think there are better ways for us to do it. Specifically, I think that we should start working on getting ourselves a Tinker's Smeltery. The side benefit of getting the Tinker Smeltery is that not only is it going to allow us to automatically process all of our metals into their ingot form, but it's also going to allow us to upgrade our pickaxe here to a higher tier using metal parts for things like the tool rod, tool binding, and more importantly, the tool head. So in order to get a smeltery up and running, we do have to start by getting a seared melter and a seared heater, because in newer versions of Tinker's Construct, you actually have to have a very basic Tinker's Construct smeltery setup up and running before you can make the bigger multi-block smeltery that you might have seen in the past. Now, 
Most of these recipes are the same. Most of them are just different variations of seared brick with the occasional bit of glass thrown in as well. And seared brick, thankfully, is incredibly easy to make. We make it by smelting grout and grout we can make by crafting together sand, gravel, and clay. As we saw in the last stream, we can make clay by breaking down dirt. The element that we're looking for is this one right here, the kalanite. Once we have enough kalanite, we can process that into clay. And thankfully, the sand and gravel should also be incredibly easy for us to come by because for that, all we need is silicon dioxide. We can take that silicon dioxide over to our compactor. And if we press U here, we can make gravel. And then if we grab another stack of silicon dioxide, we can do the exact same thing to make our sand. And that should give us basically everything we need to get a very large amount of grout, which we can then, of course, smelt into a very large amount of seared brick. Unfortunately, the sand is a little harder to get. It is a four to one, not a one to one. So while you do get 64 gravel from 64 silicon dioxide, you actually need four stacks of silicon dioxide to get one stack of sand. And there we go. Once we have some sand, gravel and clay, we should be able to craft all of that up into a few blocks of grout. And then we can take that grout, of course, and run it through our furnace wall here. I do want to upgrade this furnace wall at some point during today's stream. There are much, much faster furnaces that we can get in this mod pack. And it would also be ideal if we could set up uh, some kind of system to automatically fuel all of these furnaces so we don't have to keep manually running over and um, and refueling them every time we, we need them. Uh, while we wait for these to smell up, though, I think I am going to go ahead and get even more sand, gravel, and clay because I think we are going to need more than a full stack of grout. We might be able to get started with just over a stack, but especially if we want to make a big smeltery um, that can process a lot of ores very quickly, which is going to be ideally what we set up, we're going to need a lot more sand, gravel, and clay. But again, thankfully, uh, we can take things like our double compressed cobblestone, and if we wanted to, we can even process that into triple compressed cobblestone, and then if we really wanted to, we could even process that one step further into quadruple compressed cobblestone. If I get 18 double, we can make that into two more triple, and then we can turn that triple into one quadruple. And then if we put that one quadruple into our dissolver, we get different resources. We get uh, aluminum, gold, and silicon dioxide. I was told by the pack developer that you get a lot of resources from quadruple compressed cobblestone. I was under the impression that we would just get more of the same resources, but it looks like we actually get different resources for processing the quadruple compressed it does appear that the quintuple compressed and sectuple and septuple and noctuple and noctuple compressed cobblestones don't actually give you anything but uh, so the quadruple compressed is the highest tier that gives you anything but it gives you aluminum iron and gold in fairly large quantities we didn't get any iron you'll see here the odds are quite low but it does 6561 rolls so basically it does this percentage 6000 times which is, so like if you do 6,000 rolls of 1%, you're approximately going to get about 65 gold, which is, we got lucky, we got a bit extra. Basically, it's like rolling a dice 6,500 times, right? And But these are the odds. The fact that we rolled 6,500 times and got no iron is insane. But either way, uh, it looks like you can get quite a lot of stuff by compressing your cobblestone up even further. But uh, basically now I'm just going to go ahead and make even more sand, gravel, and clay. So I have made a bit more grout here, and it is all smelting up, but it is going pretty slowly. And so it's probably not going to be a terrible idea to uh, to quickly look at getting a better furnace now while we wait for all of those resources to smelt up. So we do have the um, iron furnaces mod, and I forget that this is not how you make a furnace in this mod pack in order to make a furnace in this mod pack we need at least one compressed cobblestone which uh, thankfully we can get by decompressing this uh, triple compressed cobblestone here boom and boom but uh, we do have the iron furnaces mod which adds higher tier furnaces to the pack kind of like the iron chests mod where we start out with a regular furnace and we can move up through an iron furnace into a gold into a diamond into an emerald into an obsidian in fact we do have a quest line dedicated to the iron furnaces mod here you can see we run through all of the the main ones there are a few side ones like copper silver crystal uh, also all the modium vibranium and unobtainium but i think the rainbow furnace is the highest here that you can get this thing can smelt i believe 64 items per tick it smells items just incredibly quickly which is basically uh 20 stacks per second it's crazy fast for now we should be able very easily in fact to upgrade to an iron furnace we totally can from there we can probably upgrade to a gold furnace i think we do have enough gold to make the block of gold here 
and craft the furnace up? We do. And I think we probably also have what it takes to make a diamond furnace. We don't quite. We are two diamonds away from being able to make a diamond furnace happen. I think I might quickly go and do a tiny bit of mining right down at the bottom of the world to see if we can't grab two more diamonds because I think the upgrade to the diamond furnace is going to be well worth it. And a few diamonds later, we should now be able to upgrade uh, to that diamond furnace, this guy right here, and boom. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, by default, the diamond furnace, I think it's about twice as fast as a regular Minecraft furnace. So uh, if I were to put, let's say, 20 grout in here and then 20 in here, this one is almost done. We put this one in first and it's just finished over here. It's almost on its uh, its third one. So yeah, you can see it's, it's definitely, it might be 2.5 times faster, but uh, it definitely is quicker, which is good in and of itself. But you can take things further by adding augments. I'm not quite sure why it appears right at the top of the screen when you hover over the button, but uh, this right here in the top right is the augments button. And if we click on that, in this version of Iron Furnaces, there are three different types of augments, the red, the green, and the blue augment. And if we type augment, into JI, we can see those different augments along the top here. So I think it used to be in older versions of this mod that you could only add one augment to a furnace, whereas now there are three, there are six different augments here, but you can have one of each color in the furnace. So there is the blasting augment, which allows it to work like a blast furnace. There is the smoking augment, which I assume allows it to work like a campfire, maybe, or like a smoker, I should say. Uh, then there's the factory augment, which is super cool. This, if you add this to the uh, the furnace, the furnace can then smelt four items at a time, as opposed to smelting just one item at a time. The downside to the factory augment is that it can no longer use fuel, like planks, like regular Minecraft fuel, for power. Instead, it has to use redstone flux. So you have to use a generator to provide it with power. For now, we're not gonna make the factory augment just because we don't have that much power. And from my testing, one invar generator here isn't enough to run a diamond furnace with a factory augment. You need a lot more than 48 RF per tick to be able to smelt four items at a time. There's then the generator augment. Uh, it says right click to insert the augment. Heat from the furnace will generate power. The furnace can no longer smelt items. And then over at the end here, we have one augment for speed, which halves the cook time, but doubles the fuel, which I think is worth it. And then there's another one that is more fuel efficient. It reduces the cook time, but also increases the amount that you can burn with one piece of fuel. For us for now, I think the only one that we want is the speed augment. We have enough fuel to keep us going. We just want our furnace to be as fast as is humanly possible. So the only thing we're missing here is a single piece of sugar, which thankfully we can go ahead and craft. Boom. And boom. So now this furnace should be twice as fast as it was. So if we again take some grout here, we've got five there. We'll put the fuel in. Over here, we'll put the same five in like this. It is significantly faster, and it's going to get through quite a few of those before the uh, regular furnace has even finished its first one. This is very nice. It's going to be super useful going forward to have a furnace that is this quick. And again, going forward, if we wanted to, we could add the factory augment once we get more power to be able to smelt four items this fast at a time, which again is going to make our lives a whole heck of a lot easier. For now, though, let's go ahead and dump some of the uh, silicon dioxide and the other bits of junk that we're carrying around in our inventory back into the system. And let's see if we can't get a very basic Tinker's Smeltery up and running. So over here, the quests for Tinker's are pretty straightforward. The first one is to make a seared brick. That is super easy to make. It's just the regular Minecraft recipe of making a set of brick like that. Easy. Next up, we have the seared melter. This one requires a seared tank, which does require five glass. Now, currently we have got eight glass. However, I do have a feeling we're gonna need a lot more glass today. So I am gonna go ahead and smelt up basically a full stack there. But uh, over here, we should be able to make that melter. Boom, and boom. And then the only other thing that I think we need to get a basic tinker system up and running is the seared heater. Again, very simple recipe, boom, and boom. And if I'm not mistaken, if you put a heater down with a melter on top of it, this kind of acts as a very small, very restricted smeltery in that you can put fuel into the bottom slot, like so, and then you can put other items into the top slot. In this case, we're looking to make an actual smeltery, so we need four copper ingots. And so if we quickly grab 
one, two, three, four copper ingots and throw those in. We can only put three in at a time, but this very small setup here is capable of melting ingots down into their molten ingot form. And just as soon as we have four molten ingots, what we then need to do is pull the molten copper out of the uh, little melter that we have into a casting basin. The casting basin, again, nice and easy to make. Boom and boom. And then the final piece of the puzzle for now is gonna be a regular old Minecraft faucet. Boom. And just as soon as that is done, all we need to do then is put a seared brick into the basin by right clicking. And then we can right click on the faucet to pull the molten copper out over the seared basin. And that's gonna go ahead and melt that with the seared brick to create a controller. Nice. So now that we have the actual smelter controller, we can, uh, can kind of tear this down because we don't really need this anymore. And we can use the uh, controller to set up a much larger smelter, which is what we're going to use to actually process all of our resources. So I think we will set the controller down maybe over here. I do want it fairly close to our draw controller because we need to be able to take all of the ingots that come out of the smeltery, like once we've used the smeltery to produce those ingots, we want to take those over and put them into uh, our storage drawer there via the draw controller. But now, in order to actually make a, uh, a big smeltery, we need to get quite a lot more of the uh, seared bricks here. And you can make this really any size you want. The smallest you can make this is like this. It's a little three by three, um, or at least one by one internally. This is a nice small smeltery. This would work, um, and it would allow us to start smelting items. You can see there's only one slot uh, if we made this too tall, it would give us two slots. It's not great. We can make this significantly better. The size that I like to start with is usually a, a three by three internally, but I think you can go all the way up to a nine by nine internally, which would be an 11 by 11 externally. What I mean by that is that uh, if I were to do this, this right here is a three by three internally, right? So we've got uh, three by three inside and then the smeltery itself looks like this. So I think the biggest you can do is nine by nine in the middle, which would be 11 by 11 in its total footprint. So this technically is a smeltery. As you can see here, it can smelt multiple items here. And again, we can make this taller to allow it to smelt even more items. But right now this isn't gonna work because we need a few more things, a few more blocks to actually make this work. The first thing that we're going to need is a seared tank, a fuel tank, this guy right here. That's going to allow us to put lava into the tank and therefore give fuel to the smeltery, which is what it's gonna to use to melt down our ores. We then need a way of actually getting the molten metals out of the smeltery. Unlike with the melter, you can't just pull directly out of the controller. In this case, we're going to need a drain. That's this guy right here. This bit does require copper. Thankfully, we do have copper available to us. And boom. Again, you can put this really anywhere in the uh, smeltery. The same with the fuel tank, by the way. You can put it anywhere that's not in the floor. So any of the other blocks that are not the floor or the controller could be the uh, the tank. For now, we'll leave it where it is and we'll put the drain here. In fact, I'm actually going to move the tank to the back here like that because we could, if we wanted to put a second drain here to allow us to pull out twice as fast in the future. For now, we'll just do this, but that is a possibility for us. And I think what we'll do here is we'll go ahead and make some more seared brick and we'll make the smeltery just a little taller, like that. It's gonna give us even more slots. And in the future, we could, of course, uh, make this even taller. I don't believe there's a limit to how tall this can be. It can be as tall as you can build, which I've been told in 1.18 is 320 blocks, I think, uh, is the new world height. So you could build this all the way up to Y level 320, and it would just be a very massive smeltery that you could put a staggering number of resources into. Now, as I mentioned, we are going to need lava as a fuel source for this smeltery. And while we can make lava using the crucibles here from Ex Nihilo, this is not gonna be particularly fast. And long-term, I think there are better ways that we can automate the production of lava. And so for the time being, what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a tank from mechanism here, a basic fluid tank. This thing is pretty nifty in that it can, by default, hold 32,000 millibuckets, which is 32 buckets worth of any liquid. But also, if we go to options, controls, key bindings, and type in item mode, this key binding here, which is set to N by default, if we press N, it's gonna open up other things because N is also bound to other stuff. Let me quickly check what N is bound to here. N is bound to waypoint manager, which we don't want, item mode switch, which we do want, and that looks like that's about it. So if we try again, N, 
it's going to toggle the tank's bucket mode on or off. This is super useful because with bucket mode on, you can use the tank like a really big bucket and pick up up to 32 buckets worth of any given liquid. And then you can also do the same. You can shift right click to, uh, to put that liquid back down. And so what we should be able to do here is quickly head on through into the nether and using bucket mode, we should be able to very easily get ourselves 32 buckets of lava, which for the time being is going to be more than enough to run our smeltering. And then in the future, we can also look at, uh, at setting up a system to automatically generate the lava so that we don't have to rely on coming back to the nether every single time we want it. Now, I have seen a few of these um, lucky blocks in the overworld. I haven't mined any of them because I have no idea what they do. Okay, I thought it might do something different. It gave us end gooba foo, end gobba foo, a better option than vanilla coal or charcoal. Burn time 128,000 ticks. Smelts 640 items. That is madness. So what I've done here is I've used the uh, the mining tunnel ultra mine to, uh, to get us a bit of a staircase down to here. I'm going to block this in, uh, but then I've done it again down here and we have access to a nice little pool of lava. And so we should, if we're in bucket mode, be able to just go ahead and basically pick up 32 buckets worth of lava nice and quickly. Once we're back, we can go ahead and turn bucket mode off and we can place this down over by our smeltery. Again, we could put bucket mode on if we wanted to, and then do that to, to right click lava into the tank and then turn bucket mode off and place the tank down. Um, eventually we will set up a system to automatically pump the lava in so we don't have to manually put it in, but we do now have a working smeltery, or almost I should say. Uh, there are one or two more things that we're gonna need if we want to actually get resources out of here. So uh, for example, if we go and grab some raw chunks here, let's grab the uh, raw tin. Now, in previous versions of Minecraft, the smeltery from Tinker's Construct would double the number of resources that you would get. So right now, if we were to smelt this raw tin, we would get 15 tin. In the smeltery, it used to be the case that if you melted down the raw tin, you would get 30 ingots worth of molten raw tin that you could then turn into 30 ingots, kind of like what we've been doing with our dissolver and our compactor. Unfortunately, in the newer versions of Tinker's, in the 1.18 version that we're playing, you no longer get double the number of resources. Instead, uh, if we go to the smeltery here, you get 1.3 ingots worth. So you get one ingot and three nuggets worth or 120 millibuckets worth of molten tin. So it's not quite all doubling like it used to be. The reason for this, apparently, is that in the newer versions of Minecraft, now, whenever you go and mine an ore, instead of getting that ore and then being able to double it in the smeltery, instead now you get these raw ore chunks. And unlike in previous versions of Minecraft, you can now use the fortune enchant to get more from every single ore in the game. Fortune is no longer an enchantment that only works on lapis, coal, redstone, and diamonds, and emeralds, and nether quartz. It now works on everything. So now, if you have a fortune enchanted pickaxe and you break some iron ore, you're going to get more iron ore than you would have done without that enchantment. And so I believe the logic here is that to compensate for the extra ores that you get by default, the Tinker Smeltery now gives you less per ore, which kind of sucks. But what that does mean is that if we wanted to, we could take our shape quarry cart here and craft it into a fortune quarry. That is going to allow the quarry to break every single ore block as if it had fortune. And that's going to get us substantially more resources than we would otherwise have got. And thankfully, it's really not too difficult to upgrade a regular quarry card to a fortune quarry card it's just four dimensional shards, one diamond, one emerald, one redstone, and one ghast here. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and take this card out because I think we should be able to upgrade this. Okay, so it turns out that upgrading this is gonna be a little trickier than I thought because I don't think we really have the capability of getting emeralds just yet. Um, although it looks like they shouldn't be too hard for us to get once we start uh, with a little bit of create, which I think we're gonna start doing hopefully in uh, within the next few episodes. So I'm gonna put the regular quarry card back in for now. And we should also just put some more, um, some more fuel in here as well. But uh, we'll keep an eye on that. And once we get our first emerald, we'll definitely remember to come back and, uh, and upgrade this to allow it to gather more resources with the fortune upgrade. For now though, let's quickly head on back through to the overworld and let's finish setting up our smeltery. So, Basically, now, what we can do, uh, as you've seen here, is we can put our raw metals into the smeltery, and that's going to get us 
molten version of that metal. From there, we need a casting table, which does mean we need some more seared brick, which unfortunately we don't have because I crafted all my extra seared brick into seared bricks. That is fine. We uh, can go ahead and make some more grout here real quick. And once we have a seared casting table, we can come on back over to our smeltery. We can do something like this, and we can put down the uh, faucet again. And so now we have the ability to pull our molten tin out. Now, there are two ways you can do this. We could do it, as we did before, with the casting basin. If you pull out into a casting basin, that's going to try and make a block of tin. So if we wanted to do that, we would have to have enough molten liquid in here to make a block. We'd have to have at least nine ingots worth or one block worth. So if I were to put eight more tin in, one neat part about the smeltery is that it does smelt all of the items at the same time. So the bigger your smeltery is, the more you can smelt simultaneously. But once all that is melted, we should see that we have over a block worth of molten tin in the system. We do, at which point we can then go ahead and right click on the faucet to pull out a block of tin. Pretty cool stuff. And you can use a lever to automate this, or you could use some kind of clock to, uh, to pull this out automatically. Um, and that would, you know, automate the production of tin. Pretty nifty stuff. Um, if you want to pull out in ingot form, you need an ingot gold cast, this guy right here. This is made by pulling one ingot of molten gold over uh, another ingot. So if we grab one gold and drop that in, we could then grab one ingot that we don't care about losing, let's say one copper for now. Um, I think you could also use a seared brick, actually, if uh, we didn't want to waste one of our copper, even though we do have more copper than seared brick currently, and the seared brick's probably more valuable, just to make sure it still works. Let me try pulling that over. One thing to be careful of here, you do want to make sure that you click on the liquid that you want to pull out. So you'll see right now, this is showing gold. That's because gold is at the bottom. And if I were to right click, gold would come out. If I click on tin, if the tin is at the bottom, if I right click now, the tin would come out. That's not what we want. We want to make sure we click on the metal we want and that's going to move it to the bottom. Now we can right click on our faucet and that is going to take our seared brick. It does destroy it, but it gets us an ingot gold cast. And so now you'll see that we have three ingots worth of molten tin in there. We can right click. That's going to pull out a tin ingot. And we can do that two more times. And now we have successfully processed all of our tin. Pretty cool stuff. Um, annoyingly, if you make the block and then craft it down, you get a different kind of tin. But thankfully, I think you can combine these using the drawers. So if we, for example, put the tin ingots here that we have into a drawer, I think I can then put these ingots in here. I can't. That is awkward i don't know if there is a way for us to convert those back maybe i can do this yes okay i can craft those ones down and then i think i can recraft those back up into the right tin ingots okay so just make sure if you're going to process tin that you do it the same way every time the same is probably also true for a few other materials as well outside of the vanilla stuff like iron and gold but now what i want to look at is a pretty nifty new mod that is under logistics here called Laser IO. This is a super cool mod made by the same developer as uh, Building Gadgets, Direwolf 20. And this is kind of like a new ish version of Android Pipes, or at least that's how Direwolf describes it, because it is an all in one mod that can move items, fluids, and energy all within one quote unquote cable. In this case, that cable is a laser, but within one cable. And I think we can use this to automate our smeltery in a much more efficient way than we normally would be able to. So in order to get started with laser IO, we need a few things. The very first thing that we're definitely going to need is the laser node. This is made with four iron, four glass, and one laser connector. The laser connector is made with iron, redstone, glass, and a logic chip. And the logic chip, which is involved in, I think, basically every recipe, is four redstone, two clay, one block of quartz, and two golden nuggets, all of which we should be able to do. Let's quickly craft up a block of quartz. And then, of course, we do need to get some more clay, which we can do with the 63 dirt that we have in our inventory here. Boom. And boom. Those are going to smelt up nice and quickly. We only need the one to get our first laser node, which comes from our first laser connector. Boom. And boom. It looks like we do need specifically glass pins that is fine that gets us a laser node and this is kind of the core of the mod this is what we're going to use to move items around uh, or to move fluids around in our case but to show how this works i guess i'm going to put one down and i'm going to get two chests because i think it's going to be easier to explain how this works using items and then move it over to liquids than to start right away 
with liquids. So if I make two chests here, and I put one chest here and one chest here, what we can do is we can use this to move items between the chests. Specifically, we can do that with item cards. So if we're going to do this, we are going to need two item cards. Thankfully, the item cards are fairly easy to make. Lapis, redstone, nether quartz, the same logic chip, and some gold in the form of nuggets, which we have. By default, uh, these item cards are set to insert. So if you right click on an item card, this interface comes up and as you can see in the top left, it's set to insert. Now, what we can do here, if I quickly clear out my inventory just a little bit, we got way too much stuff on us, but uh, what we can do here, let's grab a bit of cobblestone to, uh, to work with. If we put cobblestone in here and we open our laser node, the laser node has six tabs along the top. It has up, down, north, south, east, and west. So if I temporarily press J, options, waypoints, and turn my minimap back on, we can see that currently, it's kind of hard to see, but we're facing east. Uh, you can see that it says north, east, south, and west on the minimap. We're facing east, which means that uh, this side here is east, this side here is west. You can find out quickly which side is which by just right clicking on that side. Where this side is west, because when we right click it, it opens west. If we right click from the top, it opens up. If we right click from the side here, this is south. So you can open any particular side by right clicking on that face, but you can also just open anywhere and then switch to these different tabs once you're inside of the node. So if we wanted to say extract the cobblestone from this chest and put it into this chest, what we could do is we could open this face, the north one, put in our item card, and then if you were uh, want to configure the item card, you can either right click it in the world like this, or you can right click it inside of the node. So right clicking here opens the same interface. We're going to change this to extract. And so now this little laser that has appeared is connected to this chest and is trying to extract that cobblestone. The trouble right now is that it doesn't know where to send that cobblestone. Thankfully, what we can do, we can open up this face, the south face, and we can put in our item card, which again is defaulted to insert. If we put that in, it's going to start moving that cobblestone over one block at a time because now we have an extraction card pulling from this side and an insertion card sending to this side. Now, right now, it's doing that fairly slowly. Thankfully, if we go to the north side and we configure this card, it's currently set to transfer one item every 20 ticks. You can click to increase this, I believe, all the way up to eight by default. And so now it's going to move eight cobblestone every 20 ticks, which is every one second until all the cobblestone has been moved. And if you want to, you can also slow it down as well. You can uh, change the number here. Right now, I don't think you can decrease the number of ticks without overclocking the uh, the node, but you can increase the number of ticks by you know however much you want. So I could set this to uh, 80 ticks, which means it would pull eight cobblestone every four seconds. Cool. Now, if you want to go over a longer distance with this, you can. You just need another laser node. So again, it shouldn't be too difficult, I don't think, for us to make another laser node here, but this is where things get pretty cool. Uh, we are going to need another laser wrench as well, or uh, our first laser wrench, I should say, which is going to require we make another set of logic chips, but that shouldn't be a problem for us. We just need to craft up one more block of quartz, get ourselves another set of raw chips, and as soon as we have our first one here, we should be able to get our laser wrench. So if you have two nodes, or if you want to put something further away, let's go ahead and pick up this chest here. And let's say we place that over here, right? What we can do, we can put down another laser node. We can shift right click on one laser node with the wrench, then right click on another one. And these are now linked. So now over here, we can take out the insertion card because no longer are we inserting to an inventory here. And instead, because these two are connected, we can put the cobblestone back into the first chest. And over here, because these are connected, this is still looking, this extraction card is still looking for somewhere to insert the card. And so over here, if we go ahead and put the insertion card here, it's going to send that cobblestone through the laser node and insert it into this chest. Again, it's still only doing it uh, eight every four seconds. Uh, if we go back in here and change that back down to 20 ticks, it's now going to send eight per tick over into this chest. People are asking if it needs line of sight. It doesn't need line of sight. You can put blocks in the way here. Just so long as they are connected, they will work just fine. Uh, even if I disconnect this, if I temporarily go ahead and break this node here, just to show you that you can connect it uh, even through blocks. So if I do this, and I don't think it matters which one you do, we could right click this one, or shift right click that one, and then right click this one. The connection is still formed. So you can send those items through blocks, which is pretty cool. And much like with uh, items here, you can do the same with fluids and with energy. 
and also with redstone as well, just using the different cards that they have. Now, the super nifty thing is that you can even change the channels. Again, if you're familiar with Ender IO, if we right click on this item card here, in the bottom left, we have channels. It starts at channel zero, goes all the way up to channel 15. So if I set this to the orange channel, channel one, and I put the cobblestone back in over here, it's not going to extract the cobblestone because this extractor is on the orange channel. You can kind of see that green line there has a bit of orange in the middle. And then over here, this one is on, uh, actually this one has nothing just yet, but let me go ahead and put this card back in. There we go, the south card is on, but this is on the white channel. So this is trying to extract on channel one. This is trying to insert on channel zero. So it's not happening. But if we go back into here and we change this to orange channel, it's going to start moving that cobblestone over right away. This is super useful because it means that you can have all of your nodes connected to each other, but then still very granularly and specifically specify where you want certain things to go. You can even take it further. There are filters. There is a basic filter. So you could say uh, that we're going to extract the cobblestone over here, but you could say that, for example, I only want wood to go into this chest. And maybe you have a, a different chest somewhere else that you want your cobblestone to go into. You could filter this one to only accept wood. You could filter a different one to accept cobblestone. You can do a counting filter, you can do a tag filter, you can do a mod filter, there's a bunch of filters and you can really get deep into those to, uh, to really specify how you want things to work. Then there's the overclocking cards. These allow you to move items faster. So uh, if you put the uh, overclocking cards into the node here, into the extractor, that's going to allow you to lower the number, or sorry, increase the number of items that you transfer per tick up to I think a stack, uh, and then potentially even lower the number of ticks as well to move items much, much faster than you otherwise would. And on top of that, there are also extra features over in the top left here because you can enable or disable round robin. Uh, for those who don't know, round robin basically means that it's going to distribute the items amongst multiple different inventories. So if we had, you know, three chests here, say one here, one here, and one here, and they were all set to insert, if we had the extraction card set to round robin, it would put one cobble in here, then one in here, then one in here, and then one in here, one in here, one in here, and it would evenly distribute the cobblestone between all three chests, which is super useful for certain types of distribution. Uh, for example, if you had a bunch of furnaces that you wanted to send items to, you could do that. Speaking of furnaces, this is where the mod gets really cool as well, because if you have a furnace on the insertion side, you can specify where you want to insert things. So if we were to take out this insertion card, and let's say we put it in the west side, so now it's connected to the furnace, what you can do in here is you can specify where you want it to insert. So we all know, for example, that if you want to insert uh, something into the top of the furnace, you have to insert it into the top of the furnace, right? Uh, if I had a hopper here, which I might have in the system, I do, and I do this, I don't think, unless I'm wrong, that you're able, let's say we get some raw zinc, maybe, and I put that in, that's not going to go anywhere because we have to insert into the top of the furnace. However, if we go ahead, get rid of this, uh, we'll leave that there for now. However, if we put our raw zinc in here, what we can do over here is we can set this to insert up, which means it's going to insert to the top of the furnace. So the furnace here, even though it's receiving the item from the bank, thinks it's receiving it from the top and puts it into the correct slot. And what's even cooler is that you can insert multiple item cards here. So if we had a second item card, we could put more than one item card in and we could have one item card that is set to put uh, items into the top. And we could add a filter, for instance, to say to only put uh, raw items or raw metals into the top. And then we could have a second item card with another filter that says, if you receive call, put that into the bottom slot. And then we could have a third item card set to extract mode to pull the, the resultant ingot out of the furnace and send it on into like let's say the draw controller. So you can have one point of access that is then able to insert the fuel, insert the thing being smelted, and then extract the final product all from one side of the smeltery and send it off wherever you want it to go. Now for us, this becomes useful because what we're going to do is we're going to use the fluid mode on our ingot cast. So we're going to put the laser node here like this, and then we're going to get some fluid cards. And I'm going to go ahead and turn off the minimap. We shouldn't need that going forward. So in order to make the fluid card, we do need some buckets. I will go ahead and get uh, two of those. And it looks like we also need some more chips, which we should have lying around in our furnace. Also, do we have any more baked potatoes? We do. I would very much love to chop down on some of those as well. Boom. That gets us two fluid cards. So what we can do over here now is we can set this one card to extract, and we're going to put it in here. And we can then go to down and put in an insert card. So currently, there's nothing in the smeltering. The reason this is going to be useful for us here is another function of the mod, if we right click on the fluid card, and that is exact mode. The benefit of exact mode is that it will only allow 
exactly the specified amount of liquid to move. You can do the same with the item card. Uh, if you have an item card, you can right click. And uh, if you set it to extract, you can turn exact mode on and you could say five. If you do that, and let's say we had the same setup as before, it would only extract items out of this chest once it had five to extract. So if there was four double compressed cobblestone in there, it wouldn't extract it until the fifth one came in and then it would extract it. That's super useful for this because what we're gonna end up with here is uneven numbers. We're gonna smelt one raw tin and that one raw tin is gonna get turned into 120 millibuckets of molten tin, but it only takes 90 millibuckets of molten tin to make an ingot. What we don't want to do is pull out 90 millibuckets, make an ingot. I should, I'll show you actually. If we, uh, if we put in the raw tin, like so. Currently, this is just set up very basically to extract from this side and then to insert to the bottom. So as soon as this is done melting, it should pull the molten tin out from here and down to the bottom. And it did. The problem that we run into is if we take this tin out, which we're gonna do, now we run into a problem because now there isn't enough molten tin to make another ingot, but it started to put molten tin in. The reason this is a problem is that if we start pumping all of our raw metals into the smeltery, we're gonna end up with iron, gold, lead, tin, silver, everything's gonna be in here, right? And right now nothing can do anything until we get more tin. So we could have a system that's fully banked up because the tin has got stuck. This is where the node becomes super useful. Because instead, what we can do is we can put down the seared table, we can put down our basin, and in here, on the extraction card, which is facing east, we can say exact mode on, and then we can change the transfer amount. Right now it's set to 1000 millibuckets. If we uh, go ahead and lower this, so you can left click to increase, right click to decrease, you can shift right click to decrease by 10, control right click to decrease by 100, and shift control right click to decrease by 1000. If we go ahead and set this to 90, and we have exact mode on, this is only going to extract the liquid from the smeltery once it has at least 90 millibuckets. So if we do the same again here, if we put in our raw tin, what we should see this time is we should see the first ingot get pulled out, but then the second ingot won't get pulled out until there is enough in there to actually make an ingot. So this is done. We get one ingot's worth of resources and then nothing. The extra tin is still hanging in there. And so if we were to put three more tin in, one, two, three, that's gonna get us uh, three more ingots, but then it's also gonna get us a fourth ingot from the extra three nuggets we get every time. Actually, I think we only need two here, right? Not three. And now this should work perfectly because now there's exactly three ingots. It's gonna pull the first one out. If we take it, it'll pull the second one out. And if we take it again, it's gonna pull the third one out. And then the final piece of this puzzle is getting the items over into the draw controller, which I think we should be able to do here. If we take our item cards, we're gonna set one of these to insert and we're gonna put it into the correct side of this. So we are facing south, it tells you on the uh, the left here, which means that uh, the north side is where we want to insert to. So north item card, that's gonna insert. And then over here, we're gonna set the bottom, so down to item extract. Again, just extract mode. Exact can be off here, we don't need it to be exact. And then using our wrench, we can link this to this. And as soon as I right click here, we should see that tin move over into the drawers. Now the problem here that we run into is the same problem we ran into last time in that the tin is different, right? So I guess this is not the tin we want. We want that tin right there is the tin that we want. But I think that should work. Did I put this in the right slot? South, I want to put it in south, not north is where I want to put it. But uh, this, I think, should work. Let me put some uh, some regular tin in here. Oh, did it not connect? Is it too far away? Boom, boom. It didn't connect. Okay, so there is an eight block limit. I assume the eight block limit also works diagonally. So it might be too far away for this to work. But uh, what we can do is we can make a laser connector, the same guy we made earlier, and we can drop that in the middle like this. And then we can go from here over to here, and then from here over to here. And now we should see that tin get moved directly over into the drawer. Nice. And of course, if we wanted to, we could do the exact same thing here. I think we might need to make yet more of these uh, logic chips because once again, we are fully out of these. But uh, we can of course do the exact same thing using a node to move our lava out of the tank on the back as well. We can put a node here to automatically move that lava from the tank over into the smeltery. Boom. And 
boom, that gets us another laser node. We can drop that down right about there. And we can do the exact same thing here where we get a set of fluid cards. We make sure that one of these is set to extract and we put that in this side by just right clicking. And then we want to put one in the other side. This time we're facing west. So we want to put it in the west side, insert. And that should automatically start taking lava out of that tank and should continually keep the smeltery full up with lava. Pretty cool stuff. And so we have essentially here automated the processing of resources. Now, if we take our resources from the mining dimension and we send them through into the smeltery, they will get automatically smelted down into ingots. There is one problem here, and that problem is the smeltery. The smeltery will mix certain ingots into alloys. So for example, if we were to take both copper and tin and run those both into the smeltery at the same time, the copper would get turned into molten copper, the tin would get turned into molten tin, and then those two would combine into bronze, which is not what we want. We don't want to turn all of our copper and all of our tin into bronze. Thankfully, it looks like there is a fix in the newer versions of Tinker's Construct, and that fix comes in the form of the foundry, this right here. The foundry is basically the exact same thing as a smeltery, but instead of creating alloys, it doesn't. <laughs> it just doesn't create alloys. It's a little trickier to make because in order to make the uh, the foundry bricks, you have to have uh, this stuff, the scorched brick, which is made by smelting nether grout, which is gravel, soul sand, and magma creams. So instead of gravel, sand, and clay, it's gravel, soul sand, and nether clay, magma creams, which is a little trickier for us to get. Soul sand and gravel shouldn't be too difficult, but the magma creams might be a little harder for us to come by, but I think it's going to be worth it. The Foundry does work in a slightly different way to the smeltery. The smeltery gives us 1.3 times whatever resource we put in. So we put in one iron, we get one iron and three nuggets out. Whereas in the foundry, instead of getting one iron and three nuggets, we get one iron and a third of a nickel, which is interesting, a third of a nickel ingot that is. Um, and it works the same for all of the, the different resources. If we put gold into the foundry, instead of getting 1.3 gold, we get one gold and then three copper, which is really interesting. It gives us extra different ingots. But I think the main benefit of the foundry is going to be that we can use it for all of our resources. So it's unlike the smeltery, which if we wanted to use the smeltery, we'd probably have to set up multiple smelteries and we'd have to make sure that we only put in certain resources that don't alloy together. Like we could put copper, iron, and I don't know, uranium into here because I don't think any of those will mix together. And then we could have a separate one with, you know, tin, nickel, and you know, silver potentially, and those shouldn't combine into anything, but that would require multiple smelteries to do what if essentially we could do all in one inside of the foundry. And so hopefully what we should be able to do is at some point in the near future, head through to the nether, see if we can't find a large supply of magma creams, use those to make a foundry, and then use that foundry as our single smelting point to melt everything down and create a bunch of resources. One benefit to the smeltery, though, that we currently can take advantage of is its ability to melt down metals and allow us to make metal heads for our pickaxe. Now, I think one of the best metal heads that we can currently get is the cobalt head. This has a mining speed of 6.5, an attack damage of 2.25, and a durability of 800. Um, we could go for something like manulin, which actually might be better. So how do we make manulin in this version? We need debris, right? Is debris something that we can get at all tungsten and carbon yes i think it might be because it looks like we can make netherite scrap with carbon and tungsten and then we can melt that down but again in order to melt that down we need a much higher temperature smeltery we have to either put soul lava which i have no idea how you make soul lava or blazing blood we'd have to put one of those two into the smeltery in order for that to work and blazing blood unfortunately uh, requires blazers so i think for now cobalt might be the best we can do because cobalt can be melted in a normal smeltery and we do have i believe a little bit of cobalt available on the surface of the nether yeah it's right here just for a comparison by the way uh, the stone pickaxe head that we currently have is it the rock pickaxe head is that what we currently have yeah the rock pickaxe head that we currently have has a mining speed of four and a durability of 130 and attack damage of one so it's significantly lower than the cobalt head so what we should be able to do here, in order to make the cobalt head, we need two ingots worth of cobalt. Again, we do get more than that from smelting this cobalt. And so if we just go and throw that into our smeltery over here, uh, we do want to take this out. And in fact, real quick, let me take that out as well, because I don't want that getting pulled out 
via the laser node. What we want to do first is we want to make a different cast. This time we want to put our gold in and we want to try and make this pickaxe head gold cast, which is going to require a pickaxe head of some persuasion. Thankfully, it should be very easy for us to get another stone pickaxe head, which we can then go ahead and drop into here. Now, if we put in our gold ingot, that's going to get melted down. It's going to get pulled over the pickaxe head. The system will try and put that into a storage drawer, but I have locked all of these drawers here, so nothing uh, can go in unless I put it in. And currently there's no drawer allocated to pickaxe head casts, so it will just stay in the basin. And so now we can put in our raw cobalt. That's going to go ahead and get melted down. And once that's melted down, it's going to make us a cobalt pickaxe head, which we can then apply to our stone pickaxe over in the pot builder. And that's going to give us a substantially more powerful and faster pickaxe that we currently have. Not only do we get the extra durability from the pickaxe head, but it also carries over the effects of the diamond that we added before. So we'll take this and over here, we'll go pickaxe plus head. And you'll see now we're going to take our durability uh, from 600 up to 1,300, our mining speed from 6 up to 9.1, and our attack damage is going to go up a slight bit, but it doesn't really matter too much because we're not really too bothered about our attack damage. Uh, and of course, going forward, we can do the same with the uh, the tool rod. We could change our tool handle. Uh, they have things like bone tool handles, which uh, lower the durability but increase attack damage. Not super useful for a pickaxe. There is the cobalt tool handle, which could actually just be a, a straight up upgrade here. Uh, this does increase our durability, attack speed, and mining speed by 1.05x, so that could be well worth investing in. Uh, the manulin one increases attack damage, not particularly useful for a pickaxe. I think the hepatizing tool rod would be perfect for a pickaxe because it lowers the attack damage, which is fine. Uh, it's not what we make a pickaxe for, but at the same time increases mining speed by 1.2x, which is huge, right? That would be a big increase to our mining speed. Uh, also, we can add redstone to our pickaxe as well if we want to increase mining speed much like we added a diamond before if we put our pickaxe in and we add some redstone that gives us haste and that allows us to increase the speed at which we mine now haste is a little different to the diamond modifier because you can see it depends on how much redstone you put in you'll see right now it's at 16 out of 45 and that's going to increase our mining speed from 9.1 to 10.6 if we put the full 45 in that would take our speed all the way up to 13.38 and again unlike with the diamond you can put all 45 redstone in and that's still only going to use one upgrade slot i think we'll do that we'll make our cobalt pick a little faster if we wanted to go even further and put more redstone on which we could now it's going to use another upgrade slot we only have one left we could if we wanted to use another one of our upgrade slots for even more redstone but if we did it would take up another upgrade slot and we could put in another 45 but uh, let's go give this a quick test and see how good it is at mining or how fast it is now that we've made it just that little bit faster. We'll go back to small tunnel and yeah, that is nice and quick. And especially if we go into shapeless mode, we can now mine our ores just that little bit faster. And that means that between streams, it is going to make it a little easier for me to run around and grab even more resources that we can then run through our smell tree. And I think we will look sooner rather than later at seeing if we can't swap out that uh, smell tree for a foundry because again until we do we don't really have a good way we don't really have a fully automated way of processing all of our resources we can of course if we want take things like the um the copper here and just drop it straight into the smeltering and that will automatically process them which is definitely faster than us trying to do that manually with the dissolver the compactor and the furnaces but it's not fully automated because we do still have to manually you know be careful about what we put in so that we don't make any alloys once we have the foundry what we should be able to do is just pump everything into that foundry and then automatically run all of our ingots through there into their ingot form. And I guess once we have the ability to make the foundry, we should probably also have what it takes to make uh, our first set of ender chests. And so at that point, we can even take it one step further and fully automate it by putting one ender chest above the builder in the mining dimension, putting another ender chest above this laser node, and then using the laser node to automatically feed the, uh, the ores from the mining dimension straight through into the smeltery, and then of course from the smeltery right round into our storage drawer system. And I should point out as well, there is one extra benefit of this here. You can, I believe, connect up more than one node uh, to another node. So we could have another node here, I believe, and then we could connect that node to another casting table. So uh, we could have like a casting table here, 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 and here. And if each one had a node on top of it, we could connect all those nodes together and have them all extracting at the same time. So you can use multiple laser nodes to kind of extract the same thing, because as you'll see right now, one of the things that might be slowing us down is just how fast uh, one casting table is. 
that is something we're gonna have to think about in the future but unfortunately we are out of time for this episode of encrypted encrypted